let's now start with the actual material for today. We had started the discussion of matter last time, and um, this will lead us, of course, to the full statement of the Einstein field equations. I need to make a, a small correction of something that I introduced last time. It's maybe more for the, the mathematically minded um, of you, and but let me nevertheless give it. So remember last time I introduced this vector field in that is depending on the world line of particles. So what we did last time is we said that we have a world line. So even let's say one world line for the moment, which I call gamma of a point particle. And then we defined the vector field in And now I put here a little gamma just to indicate that it, this vector field depends, of course, on this world line. We defined this um, in terms of an integral. And there was a question about components. And I think my answer last time was probably not very clear. And I think I was slightly confused. So the idea is really that this should be defined component-wise. So this means that this integration could be understood as an integration where you have the terms that we had. So let me briefly write it down. So remember that the integral was essentially consisting of a multiplication of delta functions, which always, so each of these delta function for each i, look at the i's component of the world line, evaluated at whatever tau is, do an integration over all of tau, and then you compare that to the coordinate of the Q. Q is the point where you evaluate the vector field. So remember a vector field, or to define a vector field, I need to define a vector at any point Q on the manifold. So oh, Q yeah. is just a point of the manifold. And so the vector field Q, uh, excuse me, the vector field M is then, um, as I said, component-wise defined where the component on the right-hand side appears in the direction of the world line. I think last time I, I wrote this V, but remember that if we talk about components, I could also write gamma dot. That's the same. So gamma dot K is the case component of the direction vector that I called V last time. And then we also have this determinant of the metric G. Now, you see the K also appears on the right-hand side. I think so far this really corresponds to what I wrote. But then I said, in order to somehow test whether this is a well-defined vector field, and it's actually a vector field distribution, because you know that delta is a distribution or the function, um, we have to apply to a test function. So I defined something like N now, I could still the gamma apply to a test function phi. But it's important to note, and I, I think this was the mistake, that the test function phi, in the case of a vector field, itself needs to be a covector field. So the test function is not, is not a scalar, but a covector field. The reason for that is that a test function should be such that if the vector field acts on it, it should return a scalar. And of course, a covector field and a vector field can be combined to give me a scalar. So in other words, we can now integrate, and I now essentially feed the vector field m into phi, into this test function, and this gives me a scalar. Now I still need to integrate over the scalar, that so, something we already had last time. And of course, to integrate over a scalar, I need a volume form. And we take the canonical volume form omega g. And I could also write this in components. So if phi is now a covector field rather than just the scalar, it has indices downstairs. And then I would take the vector field in. Let me put brackets around it just to make clear that this um, gamma is not an index that's still the world line. And then we have this. So this thing, this, um, let's say, orange box here um, was not correct last time. So the difference is really that the phi 
should be a covector field. And then everything makes sense. The whole rest of the derivation is not changed by that. Everything remains the same. This is, was just um, the definition, essentially, what it means for such a distribution to apply it to a test function. OK, let me now continue with um, um, at the point where we stopped last time, more or less. And last time, I think the last thing I did was essentially giving you an operational meaning or a geometric meaning of um, what I called n bar. n bar is a three form in contrast to, of course, n. n itself is just a vector, a vector field. And now it's a three form, so it's of any point in the manifold, um, a zero three tensor. And it was defined in that way that we have iota with the vector field applied to the volume form. I think I discussed that, so let me do not repeat that any longer. But the re main result of the last lecture was that if we take the if we integrate over an arbitrary three surface, so this is um, I call it sigma, should be an oriented three surface integrate over it, then what we get is something very simple, namely just a one if the world line gamma intersects this region over which we integrate and zero otherwise. So this n, so it's now long, no longer a vector field, it's now a three form, that, but this three form n is has an extremely intuitive meaning. It's just essentially the thing you need to integrate over to know how many particles there are. Now there was only one, because I start with one world line, so it can only be one or zero. But of course, as I mentioned last time, you could also sum over it. And we would like to study that a bit more closely. And OK, what we are going to do now is rather basic, but it's somehow the um, prerequisites to understand the energy momentum tensor in the case where we applied the point particles. And as I told you last time, I would like to introduce the energy momentum tensor for point particles in order for you to be able to make the connection to what you already know, maybe from classical mechanics and so on, to at least connect it to some intuition one may have by considering actual particles flying around. So um, in order to do that, it's useful to look at an example, and the example would be if it would represent charge in the universe. So let's suppose we have now a sum over all particles in the universe. So the sum goes over u, and u should be any particle in the universe that is charged. And then we have a little prefactor, and then n gamma u. So the notation, so what this should mean is Again, q u is the charge of particle labeled with u. Gamma u is the world line of the particle with label u. And I just sum over those. Now, it's obvious from the definition I gave, I think I already mentioned that as well last time, that if we now integrate over q bar, so we do everything the same. Of course, the whole thing is linear. So if I take the bar of this, this is like taking the bar of each of these ends. So I, I convert each of these ends into a volume form. So the integration over Q bar essentially counts or gives a contribution from each n or from each particle u that intersects that region. And of course, the contribution, the contribution is weighted by the charge of that particle. So what we get is the total charge And I call this now passing through sigma. Just for you to remember or um, to remind you of something, we discussed integration in detail. And what we have seen is that if this sigma is a small cube, this is a cube sp spanned by vectors. So let's suppose I have three vectors, v1, v2, v3, and then you find a cube. And 
um, assume that this cube is small, then this is equivalent to say we just take this form, the form u bar, and put in the vectors as arguments. And what it spits out as a scalar is, um, again, this number. So you can interpret the q form, the form q bar, as an object that is defined everywhere in space. But it's an object that takes as input three vectors. So you can go everywhere in space, actually in space time, go somewhere and want to know how much charge is in, in the region there. So what you do is you define a small q, you define it in terms of these feed, these three Vs into this form Q bar, and the Q bar tells you, oh, there are so, so many charges here, the total charge in this little cube is that. And that you can do at every point in space. So in that sense, Q is now a, a field, if you want, that, I mean, a field in the sense that it's defined everywhere in space time, that gives you an answer to a well-defined physics question, namely how much charge is there. Now, we want to, I want to now relate that again to the vector Q. Because initially we, we defined this vector Q and now I, I told you what is the meaning of Q bar. And we want now to understand a bit better what the vector Q itself is without the bar. So how, how does this thing now relate to the vector? But I assume now we understand the bar well. And in order to do that, um, I want to make um, explicit that um, volumes or that three surfaces in space-time can either correspond to, to a spatial volume or to an area in space together with a time. So let me make that um, or illustrate that with a picture. So let me for this time as an exception draw two spatial dimensions and the time dimension x0 that's space time, of course. And I just don't draw x3, it doesn't mean it's not there. But I draw next to it just a, a picture of space alone. And when I draw only space without time, then I still have here enough sp space, if you want, on my whiteboard to still draw the x3 axis. Now, consider a cube in space. So let's draw a little cube in space. And cube in space may look like this. Now how does this cube look like in space time? So maybe I'll, I'll even call this cube here sigma because of course a cube is a three surface so it's, a, it's exactly something we can integrate over um, as before. I mean then we integrated over the charge and field Q bar. So how does this thing look like in this other picture? In the space-time picture, of course, it doesn't go along the x0 direction. It's, too, it's still a three-dimensional thing. I just didn't draw a dimension, but on this picture, it looks essentially like a two-dimensional thing because I, I omitted the third dimension. So that's a rather trivial statement. But let's now look at a two-surface in space. So for example, I could look at the surface here of, uh, let, let me take a different color. So I look at this one side of the, of the spatial cube. That's now indeed a two-dimensional area. That's like a window. So this window of this room, that's like a window. How does this window look like in the space-time diagram? The window is just this line segment because, again, I just omitted one dimension. Now, of course, in the space-time diagram, the window persists and it may, may be moved, but let's suppose I chose the co coordinates in such a way that the window stays at the position zero, or at least one side of the window. Then the world line, so to speak, of the window, it's actually a cube, not a world line, looks like this. And the world line of the cube is, of course, again, a kind of now actual four-dimensional object. That's the cube that just sits there at this point where um, the coordinates x1, x2, x3 are zero and it just moves in time. Now for sigma, I think everything is 
completely clear. So I could maybe in terms of, of let me write it in words. So sigma is just a surface in M that corresponds to, so it's a three surface in M, but it corresponds to a spatial volume. That's what I said. But it's a spatial volume at the fixed time. So you see then, because it's here a, really a surface that is, that doesn't extend in the x0 direction. So if I, okay, let me again skip these lines that go up. If I just look at the actual surface, sigma, the, the three um, surface sigma, then it has to be placed somewhere in time. It doesn't have an extension in time. Otherwise it would be a four dimensional thing. So the world line of the cube would be four dimensional, but sigma corresponds really to the cube at the particular time. So it's a spatial volume at fixed time. Now, what does it mean to have a three surface in the space-time diagram that has a time direction? So let's look at such a thing. Let me choose another color. And let's call it sigma prime. I again, take this three surface. So in, in terms of, like in, in the four-dimensional picture, it's a very similar object to sigma. I can also integrate charge Q bar over it and so on. But what does it mean? So clearly, in, in, we could have this shape here. So that would be a three surface. Again, it would be a three-dimensional thing, but the x three dimension is missing. But it extends now the time direction. If I take just a snapshot of this at one time and draw it in the picture, I have it on the on the right hand side. Then it corresponds essentially to a. Um, and I mean, if I take this line, if I take a snapshot, then it corresponds to what I have before drawn as the red line. So remember the red line was this thing here. So if I take a snapshot of it, it's essentially in the space diagram still, of course, a surface, but it has an extension over time. So two dimensions are space, one is time. So I could describe it by saying it's a, spatial area over a time interval. That's what sigma prime is. And of course, the time interval is the interval that I indicate here on the left hand side. Okay, why do I do all that? Of course, before when I said we integrate the Q bar, we were not necessarily think, I mean, I didn't make a restriction on, on sigma. It could be like a, a spatial volume or it could be a space surface, so a, a space area together with a time interval. And now let's see what that means for the right hand side. So here I just said it's the total charge passing through sigma. So what does it mean to be the total charge passing through sigma? So let's draw a world line into our picture. And the world line here could be one. So let's suppose we have a world line here that is moving like this. And let's suppose it enters here at this point that I indicate the green, it, or it intersects the green um, surface at this point. Maybe I'll make that clear with a green color. So at this point, it intersects the green surface. And let's suppose it intersects also the blue surface, let's say here, then it sticks out. So I hope you can imagine what this means. This would mean that actually the, um, this world line would be behind the blue surface until it is here, and then it would stick out and be closer to us afterwards. Okay, now, if we integrate it over the green surface, what does this mean physically in the right picture? So let's do that. So let's um, 
suppose that we integrate now again over sigma, we take Q bar. And as I told you before, let's suppose the cube is small. Then I could also write this as um, Q bar. Um, and I chose the coordinates in such a way that the coordinates are just aligned with the Q. Of course, I can always do that. I can first put the Q and then choose the coordinates. And remember that normal coordinates can always be still rotated, actually Lorentz transformed and rotated in space or boosted and, and rotated in space, which corresponds to any Lorentz transformation. So let's suppose it, it's that. This would just mean in the picture, by the way, that here is the point one, here also one. This means the Q has exactly, is exactly as long as the unit vector in coordinates. So it's a unit Q. Now, according to what we just said, this is the charge, as I said, passing through sigma. But what does passing through sigma mean? Sigma is now a spatial volume at the particular time. So it just means it's the charge that is in the spatial volume sigma at the certain time. That's what this means. So it's the charge in sigma at this fixed time. And the fixed time is wherever I put this green surface. I could have shifted it upwards and then it's at another time. So let's integrate, let's do the same again with the sigma prime. So I integrate again over sigma prime. So this time it will be some tubes spanned by d to the x zero, d to the d x um, one, it still extends into the one direction. And then I think it doesn't extend in the two direction, but let's suppose it has again to expand in another direction, it extends again in the three direction. So that's essentially corresponding to the window, the blue window that I've drawn on the right hand side. Okay, so what does it now mean? If you read again what I said before, so the statement that I wrote down here was just a statement in space time. It's again the charge passing through sigma, this time sigma prime. So what does charge passing through sigma prime mean here? It's actually the charge in the spatial picture that passes through the red window, which is a real window in two space, over the time interval given here by the space time diagram. So let me again write this down. This corresponds to charge. Now, I, if I write it in the space picture, so to speak, not the space time, then I would say it's a charge flowing through. Um, okay, maybe I'll just use colors to indicate what I mean through what it is flowing. So here it was in the previous example, it was flowing really charged in the cube that was um, here, and green. And now it's the red window that I'm, so it's the charge flowing through this red thing during time interval. Um, let me also maybe use a color for that during a certain time interval, which I write here with the blue color. I just write it here and indicate it here again with a blue color. So I hope it's clear what this means. I spent now quite some time on that. But it's important that you understand that it's the same object, therefore, it's the same Q bar that has two different meanings. On the one hand, it's kind of how much charge is in a spatial volume. And also, it tells me how much charge flows through an area, the red area, over a certain time. It's the very same object, just fed with different inputs. You see, the difference is here I feed it with three spatial inputs. This gives a spatial volume. Here I feed it also with a time um, directed vector d to the dx zero, and that's why it gives me something that is to be interpreted as the charge flowing through an um, inter time interval. And now you see this, um, and this will be essentially the result of the first hour today. This Q has something to do 
that this result of Q bar has something to do with charge density, if you like. This has something to do with current sewer surface. But let's make that even more precise. I'm um, sorry, may I ask a question? Yes, please, yes. Um, so I was just wondering, in the for sigma prime, mm -hmm. the like world line could stay inside that surface for a while. Would yes. the expression then still be well defined, or would it just blow up to oh, infinity? Because uh, here we just assume that it pierces it once and then is outside okay. again, right? Yes, actually, one would have to be careful about defining it in the proper way. So the idea would be that um, if it's Kind of staying in the surface that the integral over it would only once give a contribution. Now I'll, I would have to check, let me not do it now because that may be a bit cumbersome, but I would have to check whether we will have to somehow treat it as a special case in this definition. I guess not, but I'm not absolutely sure, so I would have to check. That. But the idea is um, that the definition is such that if, for example, so let's suppose Actually, let's take a slightly different example from what you're asking. Let's suppose the green line, uh, the orange line, the world line, passes through sigma prime from the inside and then goes back in and passes again out. So remember that I always said it's a, a oriented surface. And therefore, depending on from which direction it passes the surface, it will give a plus one or minus one. I didn't write this before. Actually, I. And this is something we didn't, um, I could have mentioned already here. Here I just wrote it's one. But remember, this was a result from last time. We have assumed that we have a particular orientation of the surface. Now, if we change the orientation of the surface or we change the orientation of the world line, this would be the minus one. So in that particular case that I mentioned, when it comes out and goes in again and goes out again, then it would actually be a contribution of plus one, minus one, and again plus one, they would add it, it would just be a one. And so you see now that it could go arbitrarily often in and out, and it would just either give a one if it at the end is out and was in before, it would give a zero if it remains, if it's at the end where it started, and it would give a minus one if it was coming from the outside and maybe passing arbitrarily often and then the inside. And now this great line where it just stays on the surface, I mean, by continuity, should then just match that. So it should actually, if, let's say, it goes into the surface, stays there, and then again goes towards the inside, it should then add up to zero, because you can see it as just being there. But at the end, so physically, it's clear that this should happen. Now the question is mathematically whether we really have to do something um, like treat it as a special case. I guess not because we were careful enough to treat these deltas as distributions and so the integration should be with that. But you can also think it in a, this perturbative way. Just think of instead of really staying in the surface that it just fluctuates around it. And then the result is exactly um, how I said it would just add and subtract as often as it passes the surface and then accumulate to either minus one, zero or one. I hope this answers the question for the moment. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks for asking, because that, that was anyway an important point that we have this oriented surface. And actually, let me just here make now a statement that is of interest for later. You know that there's, of course, charge conservation. And that's a property we have, and that's not something that has anything to do with relativity. Here, we just know charge is conserved. So let's see what this means mathematically. Now we can express that. And then you see how these things all come together. Because so far, you may not be very impressed. And he's saying we can just have a vector field. This vector field counts how many particles are there. But now you will see that it actually connects to all the concepts we introduced. So let's consider a four volume U. So this should be the four submanifold of our space time. So I never write space time. So whenever I mean submanifold, it's to be understood that it's a submanifold of space time. So the picture now would again be a space time picture um, where we would have here x zero. And you would now really be a cube in the space time. So they should not to be confused with the cube I've 
drawn before, which was a spatial cube on the right hand side in the space picture. Now I have a, a four dimensional cube. So it's a cube that extends over all three dimensions of space as well as time. Now what I can do, if I like, is I can integrate over Q bar, which is a three form. So obviously I cannot integrate over U because U is four dimensional and Q bar is a three form, but I can integrate over um, the boundary of U. Now the boundary of U in this particular example just consists of the six surfaces of the Q. Now, what I told you just before that um, um, integration just sums with a sign. That was just what I um, mentioned as an answer to the previous question. And the sign depends on the direction from which you pass the surface. And if you take that into account and now think of a burnt line um, in this picture, so there's a burnt line here, gamma, that may intersect the cube here on the bottom and here on the top. It could also be another one of a second particle that enters the cube also on the bottom, but then leaves it here um, on the side. But obviously any world line that enters has to leave the cube again. This is just because world lines never end. And the ending world line would mean that there's a particle with a charge and this charge suddenly just disappears. And, and charge conservation now really means world lines don't end, which means that any world line that enters the cube has to leave it. So we always get a plus one and a minus one contribution because of course the direction um, is the opposite when you enter and when you leave the surface, you can think of a, even a sphere, it doesn't have to be a cube. And um, whatever shape you have, this will therefore be true. So that just tells you world lines enter and leave again. But now, Remember that we said that instead of integrating over the boundary via Stokes theorem, we can also say that we integrate over U, over the whole reality. But we have to integrate the exterior derivative of U, which obviously is a four form, so I'm perfectly allowed to integrate over it. And um, as I said, Stokes tells us that this is just the same as before. We know, therefore, that this has to, uh, excuse me, this should of course be a Q bar. So we know that this is the same as the integration of a Q bar and that's zero, which is true for any choice of U. I didn't make any assumptions about what U is. And if this integration over U is always zero, this integration here. This means that necessarily the argument of the integration needs to be zero. So this means that the exterior derivative of Q has to be zero. So this really tells us that charge conservation means that um, mathematically that the exterior derivative of this Q field that we introduce is equal to zero. So now you see why, what the meaning is or what, how exterior derivatives appear here in physics that have a very clear meaning. They're, they're essentially the mathematical objects that allow us to express infinitesimally. So for arbitrarily small volumes that things don't disappear, in this case, charge. Of course, later we'll be also interested in other things like energy and momentum, we'll come to that. But let me now make another remark, note that, or remember that Q bar was defined, or, um, if I just copy the definition of before, as the iota applied to the Q vector field, and then um, applied to omega g. And now if we take the differential the exterior derivative here and here, then you may remember that the expression here is exactly the definition of the divergence of Q. Q is now a vector field, it's without the path. So we have this divergence times omega G. That, that's just the definition of divergence, that the, the second equality. 
But if you now know that d q bar is zero, this necessarily means that the divergence of q has to be zero, which could also be written in terms of coordinates, as you have seen also in the exercises. I could write it like this. This means the covariant derivative of the vector field Q um, with respect to the direction I, and then taking the trace here is equal to zero. So we have therefore been able to reconstruct um, another expression for charge conservation. And I will um, maybe after the break we come back to that and explain how this connects to things you already know from electrodynamics and so on. So actually to, to, as a preparation for that, or just to also finish that whole discussion, let's see how we can understand the vector Q even better. So, so far we had an understanding of Q bar. That's not the same as Q, of course they are related exactly by the relation I used here, but we understand well that Q bar is an object that takes as input a volume a three volume or a three, um, um, yeah, it's an area times the time and tells us how much charge is there. And but what does the vector mean? And, and the vector doesn't take an input, so how can I interpret the vector Q? So let's see if we can understand that. So let's try to work out what the vector Q means or the components of the vector. Let's look at again a spatial volume. So maybe I'll write a small question here, just that you know where we are. So what does the vector Q or the vector field or vector Q mean now as we understand Q bar? So consider again, or let's do a special case. Consider a spatial cube with side lengths L. Or let me call it lambda. So the volume would be lambda to the C. So actually, um, in the notation that I may have used earlier, um, this could be written as um, cube and then the vectors that span it. And maybe to define the vectors, um, let's also move to normal coordinates. So consider also normal coordinates. You know, we can always do that. There are always normal coordinates. And I said already before that if you have a Q, we can even always rotate the coordinates such that they are aligned with the sides of the Q. This is because we still have this freedom of Lorentz transformations. So then the cube could be written as the cube spanned by the vectors lambda times d to the d x1, lambda times d to the d x2, and lambda times d to the d x3. So that's a notation that I used some time earlier when cubes already arose. Now, um, what we know already is the following. If you look at the charge, um, so I look at the charge in this spatial volume that is given by this cube, I not I still write it for once just to we're still talking about that Q. So the charge in that volume is given by you now know that Q bar evaluated for these vectors. But what is Q bar? Q bar is by definition this thing that's a three form Q bar. And um, now I just need to feed it exactly with the vectors that span the Q. That's what we saw. So this is only an approximation, but um, we, if you assume that lambda is sufficiently small, this holds perfect. So maybe um, it is still an approximation side, but right here that lambda would be arbitrarily small. So of course, in the limit, so this is a mathematically precise statement, um, which I could also phrase as in the limit where lambda goes to zero, I have an exact equality. But I find it sometimes 
easier to think of it just in the finite size regime where lambda is not arbitrarily small. And now by linearity, I can take the lambdas out. So I get a lambda to the power of three. This is not an index three. Now remember how this thing was defined here. This was defined, I mean, by just taking the volume form. The volume form has this um, square root of determinant of g. And then um, in the basis, in a, if you have defined the basis, it looks like this. And this whole thing has to be fed with arguments. I don't really have enough. Oh, actually, let me also use the fact that they are normal coordinates. Because they are normal coordinates, like the determinant of g is just one. So I could just erase it. This gives me some space here. So I can shift this over. And now I can even write on which arguments we evaluate this. So the first argument is the q. Remember, that's what this Yotta does. Yotta just says put in as the first argument q, and then put in the remaining arguments, which are the three spatial vectors. And you remember that the gamma is already considered. This was already moved to the front. Okay, I have this expression here. And um, it's not very readable. You put again e to the e to the three. It's the three vectors that we have. But what's this? I mean, what's this whole object? You can easily evaluate it. Remember again that what this means is just all permutations of tensor products of these four little things. But the only permutation that will give a contribution is the one where this dx1 matches with d to the dx1, dx2 matches to this one, and so on. So there's only the identity permutation that will give a contribution. And when we put the identity permutation, then this will be eaten by this and just give a one. And so and the same for all the remaining ones. And dx0 will hit q. So what we will get is still this prefactor lambda to the three, and then just dx0 applied Q. So that's the zeroth component of Q. Now what I would like to have, I'm now not happy with that because this thing is still a coordinate dependent expression. Whereas I started with something that is essentially um, coordinate independent. Of course, I defined the Q in terms of coordinates, but the Q can be defined before, or we even did that. We defined the Q before we had coordinates and then I said, Let's choose the coordinates in such a way. But um, so the coordinates, let me erase them here again. The cube was first there. So the charge in the volume of the cube is given by this expression, but now we still have something that depends on the coordinate x0. So let's try to get rid of this coordinate. And one way to do it is to say that x0 could also, or the component q0, could also just be regarded as the component that I get if I take the, essentially the scalar product, which is given by the metric of the vector q with a vector u. And what's the vector u? The vector u should just be essentially the vector d to the d x zero. But d to the d x zero is the vector that is orthogonal to the cube in space time. So I could write this. Um, in this way for u orthogonal to the q that I chose. So, okay, orthogonal now really means in space time. So I have three spatial dimensions because so the orthogonal thing is now a time dimension in this particular case. But the expression actually holds generally. So what I just did here could as well be repeated, of course, for a cube which has a time dimension here instead of three spatial dimensions. Then I would always carry them up to here, and the u would then be a spatial vector. We can therefore interpret, I mean, now we have an interpretation of q. We could say that q. Um, corresponds to Okay, Q alone maybe doesn't tell us anything, but we can now say GQ 
u. So if we take, um, okay, maybe I'll write this on the new page. So therefore, let's take any u. I could also start with the vector u. So instead of actually defining a cube in the first place, I could just say, let's define a vector and take the cube that is orthogonal to that. That's always well defined. That's the same thing that you do in three dimensions. When I tell you, please define an area, then you could define a vector orthogonal to it. In, in four dimensional space time, if I define a vector, I get as an orthogonal string the three, dim the three dimensional object. And I could say, let's take the cube in these dimensions. So let's think in that way. So what it means is if you take any u, any unit vector, okay. Maybe u should actually be um, of unit length. I forgot to write that. So unit vector. So for any unit vector u, g q u, u corresponds to the charge density. with respect to the three volume orthogonal to u. So why did I say density? Uh, actually, this may not have been entirely clear. Why did, did I say density? Notice that I still have this lambda to the three here in front. So I could divide everything by lambda to the three. You see, we had here started by saying, what's the charge in the volume in this cube? And now we said the charge in the, vol in the cube is lambda to the three times this expression. So if I divide everything by lambda to the three, then I get the charge in the cube divided by the volume of the cube, which is the density. And so that's what I wrote here. So G Q U corresponds to the charge density. Now I could do the same. Let me just, um, I know the break should have started, but let me just spend two more minutes on that because that will finish um, essentially that section more or less. And we could now play the game, same game as before and look at different views. So let me briefly remind you of this picture. So the sigma was here a um, um, such a three volume. And I could here draw into the picture also the u vector. So the u vector corresponding to the green sigma would be a vector going into the time direction. The u vector corresponding to sigma prime would of course be a u vector in this direction. That would be the u prime. So therefore, when I say that um, it's the charge density in the volume orthogonal to u, if u is a time direction, then it means it's really um, the density with respect to a spatial volume. So it's the usual density. So I could write something as follows. I could say q, so let's again go to coordinates. So for the moment, so that was the coordinate independent statement, but in coordinates, I could take u to be d to the dx zero. And then what I get is, of course, q zero by the scalar product. And I could say, okay, q zero really corresponds therefore to the charge density. What does q one correspond to? Actually, um, if I go back to the picture, it's maybe more natural to look at q two because Q2 would be the one where the unit vector U prime is something going in the two direction. So let's, uh, let's look at Q2. That's for some, so U prime would be D to the DX2. And then we would see that Q2 is now, it's the density with respect to a three volume in space time, which however corresponds again, or consists of, of a space of an area, namely this window here in the time interval. So it's actually the charge flow through the area in unit time. So it's the charge, it's the current 
what we usually call the current density in the two direction and so on. Of course, I could do it with all the cues, so actually a nicer representation of what I just wrote before could be, I could now look at this, this four tuple with all the cues, so the components of Q, and say, um, okay, we have now identified that um, first thing is the charge density, which we would usually call rho, so I don't need to write this again, this will be our conventional rho, so I put it in quotation marks because that's the, not the thing we now define, that would be the rho from classical electrodynamics or non-relativistic electrodynamics. And the other things would correspond somehow to the current density vector in normal coordinates, actually, because what I just wrote is of course only two in normal coordinates because otherwise I could not say that G U Q just gives the, for example, zero or second quantum. So in normal coordinates, I have that. So in other words, what we found, just to summarize that, is that the vector Q that we introduced is a vector that in normal coordinates corresponds to something we already know well, namely the, the zeros component is a charge and the other components are a, um, a current density. But of course, we had to do the whole work because it was not clear a priori what the kind of general relativistic object is that generalizes this in the right way. So because it's a vector field, it's a correct vector field that is defined independent of coordinates, we could now say we have found the right way to express this in a form which does not depend on the choice of normal coordinates. But when we go back to normal coordinates, we retrieve what we already knew. So we are essentially saying, we can say that's what we already knew. And so it's really the right generalization. That's by the way, a general procedure that you have to follow. When you know a concept from non-relativistic series or only special relativity, then what you have to do is try to design an object which is a tensor. So it is independent of coordinates, but in normal coordinates reduces to the thing you already know. That was now an example of such a thing. It was a quite extensive example but I hope it will be useful for what will follow after the break. So let's make a break um, of, let's say, 10 minutes and reconvene at five past one. Are there any questions that you would like me to address during the break? Uh, sorry, yes. Yes, please. Uh, for, for me, uh, it wasn't clear when you said if, if u is in the x2 direction, it's the current density. Uh, maybe the picture you draw before the graph up, um, a little bit so, off, up, this four sub manifold. Yes, so let me, let me explain that again. I was maybe a bit fast in this last part. So I hope the, the first part was clear that you, you part where it's just a charge density. So you're really asking about this part here. Is that correct? Uh, yes, and I, I would like to also understand this by the graph that you draw, this four sub-manifold, uh, the real cube that you- uh, That one. Here, yes, yes. Aha, uh -huh. okay, yes. Okay. Thank you. So um, in, in this graph, you, I mean, if, if I look at the sigma, the sigma has to be a three surface. So um, I could now choose anything. So let's choose a three surface in this graph. And let me maybe draw a new graph. It's a bit small just to be able to explain that a bit better. So we have here um, the spatial dimensions, x1, x2, and let's say here the time dimension, x3. And now um, you were asking about the case where we have this volume, this four volume in space time, which of course still in my illustration looks like a, a three dimensional thing, but it's four dimensional. Now I could choose a sigma and what I did here. So let's try to understand, for example, this thing here. So I said, let's consider a U vector, which is e to the dx2. 
So what does d to the dx2 mean? It means it's a vector that looks like this. Now, what, um, what we found is essentially that it's, and when you look at this definition, it's a charge density with respect to the three volume orthogonal to u. So let me put the vector u here. Okay. Now, of course, there are several surfaces um, with u. I could place them wherever I like. But for example, I could place a surface. It doesn't need to even be the full q. I could just, or let me do the, the full. So that would be a surface that is orthogonal to um, u. This thing would also be a surface orthogonal to u. So I could also choose that one. And of course, u is defined everywhere in space time. So um, let's say if I really think, if you remember that vectors have a place, then in principle, you should think infinitesimally, by the way, maybe that's, I could also add that to this explanation that we, we are actually thinking of something infinites infinitesimal. So let's take the vector here at the zero point, then an infinitesimal surface of course, I draw not infinitely small, but a small surface here would be that. It could also be a vector u, for example, in the tangent space associated to that point here. So let me choose one close to it, let's say that point here. And then I could draw a little surface here. That would be a surface on the back of the key. So that's, again, part of the vector u. And that would be u at the point p when this is point p, and that would, would be another point. So that's um, um, what we have to always remember that um, when we're talking about vectors, we are always at a certain point in the space time manifold. Now, let's for the moment focus on this one, for example. Of course, in a spatial picture. Um, so if I look at, um, so if I just ignore the third component, so I just have x1, x2, then of course this little green thing just looks like a line. But of course it's not a line, it's just you could imagine you look from the top on it and it also has a third dimension. So it would be like a window, but if you look at the window from the top, then it look, looks like this. Now let's look at the world line, a possible world line of a particle which, which is charged. So of course there could be a world line which never enters this window, but there could be another one which, for example, here hits the window and then um, continues inside of the cube. Okay. Now, in the spatial picture, you know, we would, in principle, have a sequence of spatial pictures, because when I draw a spatial picture, I somehow exclude time. So I could actually draw two spatial pictures, or many, and say this is the picture at time. Time is, of course, x0. So I could say this is the spatial picture at time x0 equal to 0. And this will be the spatial picture at x0 equal to some small time delta t or something small. Now, in the spatial picture, of course, the particle which has a world line is just a point. So if you look from the top at time 0, this point would maybe be here. And maybe at a certain later time, this little dot may be inside. So the dots will correspond to taking a snapshot maybe here and later when, when it's inside. Okay. Now, if, it, if you think conventionally of currents, of, of current density, or let's just think for the moment of current. I mean, current density, of course, means you, you're also normalizing with the area. Then you would have, I mean, in, maybe physics one or two, you would have a spatial picture in mind. And you would just say how you have this window look seen from the top and you're asking yourself, 
how much charge passes through this window per time interval. Now, of course, in the space-time picture, this really just corresponds to how many world lines cross this little window here. Now, this window, um, as I said, is defined orthogonal to UP. So let's now see what we wrote here. We said that um, this G QU corresponds to the charge density with respect to the three volume orthogonal to U. But the three volume orthogonal to U is now exactly this thing. So it's essentially how much charge per such little window is there. So density always means per such window. Now, because this window, as I said, has a time, um, a time um, extension, let's call this delta t, and let's look, say the spatial dimension is something like delta x, and then it would also have a y di or a set dimension, which we don't see here. So we could say that what I wrote here, so let me just write it again. If you look at Q, G of Q, and now we put this particular vector U, which I chose to be e to the dx2, e to the dx2. Then, as I said, we, we have charge. Uh -huh. Maybe I'll, I'll do. Um, Let me maybe come from, from here, because that may be clear. So let's look at the charge really in this cube. And so the G times the dimension. So what we found before was that if you look at the charge in, in a certain cube, then we get the dimensions of the cube times this G. So in other words, what we already found is if I take this times the dimension of the cube, and the dimension the cube has now a time direction and a spatial direction x, and another spatial direction which is not drawn because I don't draw certain dimensions. Then we know that this corresponds to the charge in this um, cube, in this um, green thing over the time interval. Now, I can, of course, somehow divide, divide this. Um, and, oh, before I divide it, let me briefly write that this corresponds, of course, to the charge that is in, in the wind that passes. So as I said in, this, in the two-dimensional picture, passes the window of dimension delta x delta z over time interval delta t. So that's what such a window means. Now you see, I can now divide things. I can now say g q e to the dx2, therefore, has to be this charge in um, the window over t, over delta t. Let me just um, abbreviate that charge in delta x, delta y, delta t. So I'm not, sorry, not delta y, delta z. Delta t divided by the dimension of the window and the time, delta x, delta z, delta t. And you see this? This is what corresponds to a flow. Actually, I, um, I think this is not a good way to write it. So it's charge passing, just copy passing through window per um, in interval delta t divided by delta t as well as the size of the window, size of window, which would be delta y and delta, uh, delta x and delta z. So that's the size of window. 
And now if you read this expression, that's really a, 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 a flow or that's a, a, a current density because charge passing through a window per certain time divided by the size of the window and the time gives you essentially the charge density by definition. Okay, somehow I'm not sure um, I said now much that helps because I somehow repeated it for a concrete example, but I hope it um, still gives you some intuition for these quantities. Yes, yes, I understood well. Um, and also when it's when u is in the x zero direction, it mm -hmm. is in u uh, time direction, then um, yeah. then you could also uh, like just draw this infinitesimal uh, window. Yes, right. I would just then have a window which is like in, in the diagram I had earlier, like this. Then it would actually correspond exactly to this picture here, where the green thing is now the window. I mean, the window is now a pure, it's now not a window, like a real window, it's now a really a spatial, a spatial volume. Uh-huh, uh, okay. So, I mean, in this picture that I, um, you see here on the screen now, the window would be, something that is flat like this. But the, the rest of the consideration is the same. Instead of a, a window that extends over time in this sense, it's just a window that is flat and therefore corresponds to a pure spatial window, because again, I didn't have to serve dimension, so that's still a cube. Yes, okay. And if that was unclear, just don't hesitate to ask me maybe at the end again. And um, after the lecture, I could also again draw that part in if you think that would help. Thank you. Okay. So let's continue if um, the um, action, oh, I, I lost something. Um, so I have closed, oh, here it is. Okay. So we saw that the vector Q has a rather intuitive mean as density and current. And now we remember that I also said before that the conservation of current is in this covariant picture written as QI. I. But now you see a connection because what does QI I mean? If I now take this little table or table, this identity that you see here on the right hand side, what in normal coordinates of course, a derivative, a covariant derivative, like here, the semicolon is a covariant derivative, just corresponds to a normal derivative. So in, no, in normal coordinates, I could write this as d rho divided by the zeros component, but the zeros component is just the time. So now I'm, let's say this is now not, this is a correspondence, I haven't talked about time, but of course in normal, treatments of, of um, vector dynamics, we introduce time and each zero corresponds to time. What are the, the remaining terms? Of course, for example, um, the next term is the first vector of, of, the, of the current density and we divide that by the first spatial coordinate. Now we are in three space and so on and so on. So what we get is an expression you should be extremely familiar with, at least if you learn about electrodynamics, which I could namely write as d rho over dt is equal to minus the divergence of the current. Oh, excuse me, I haven't, maybe it's better if I write it like this, plus this plus the divergence of the current. But of course, qi I being zero, which is what we said means that things are conserved, now mean that you have this continuity equation that you know from classical electrodynamics. So the continuity equation from classical electrodynamics therefore corresponds in some way this thing here that we wrote in the two bar case or to this one that's another way to write it or this one here that's all the same that's all the continuity which all means that charge cannot disappear or reappear 
But actually, it's a local statement. It would not be true if, for example, I had only global charge from conservation. So for example, if a charge could disappear here and reappear where you see it now instantaneously, that would be um, also a violation of the continuity equation. The continuity equation really tells you things have to flow right, along world lines. So what I just described, the example corresponds to a charge whose world line stops somewhere and continues somewhere else. So it would be a discontinuous world line. So in some sense, this thing tells you world lines, I mean, if you replace, if you see it in terms of point particles, world lines never end and never start of charges. Now this would, um, okay, I think this concludes the sectional charge, but it suggests something which is actually wrong. And it's now also pedagogically wrong to tell you something wrong. I will nonetheless do it. Of course, I tell you it's wrong. So one could ask the following question. What about the same definition that we have before just apply to mass. So I could define a mass vector field and say, um, I sum over all the world lines of all the particles and take all the masses of these particles. So compare this expression to the expression I wrote down here an hour ago. It's just the same except that I replaced mass or that I, I exchanged charged by mass. I mean, of course I can define it. There's nothing wrong with defining it. So that's a valid question one can ask. It just turns out that in general relativity, this thing has no physical significance by itself, or maybe only in special cases. And the reason is um, that unlike for charge, where you have charge conservation, as we just said, you don't have mass conservation. Mass can change. I said that already last time. Mass um, changes very, I mean, typical case where mass changes is when, is when you do a reaction or, or for example, as a, of course, even more a particle physics experiment, very few particles, and the masses of the end products will not correspond to the masses you had before. So this would be something where a world line actually ends in the sense that Maybe there's an incoming world line of a particle and suddenly you have two particles, two world lines coming out. So, and, and the masses and associated in these world lines don't sum up to the incoming one. So the, it's simply not true that we would have conservation of that thing. And it turns out that conservation of quantities is important for quantities to have um, a meaning or at least a, um, quantities that would appear in fundamental equations. And what we want is actually to write down the Einstein field equations. And one could now be tempted to say, I define this field M, this mass field, and say, this is the source of gravitational fields. And as I said, that's wrong. So the, the not a good idea. And the reason which I just mentioned now, already, on, already informally, and I will come back to it, is that um, this is not true. So the reason is that dm equals zero, so the corresponding statement for charge does not hold, not true in chain. Nonetheless, the thing that will be relevant for the um, Einstein equations is something that involves mass and is conserved. So you could ask yourselves, what, is the, what could we do instead? So if that's not a good idea, what then? Okay, let me answer that question. And um, the question will, or the answer will immediately lead us to this so-called energy momentum tensor. which is exactly the object appearing on the right-hand side of the Einstein equation. So the reason why I spent so much time on point matter is that I now want to use point matter to give you an intuition what this energy momentum tensor is. It's also, it has also different names. Um, I like this name because 
people also connected to stress and so on. Um, I think it captures energy momentum, captures the meaning, the physical meaning of it extremely well. And I will also, um, I, yeah, we will see why, but it's also almost the answer to the question I asked. The question is, I asked is, what thing is conserved? We have to charge conservation. And now you see this title, energy and momentum. Of course, energy and momentum is something that you may expect to be conserved. And indeed, it turns out it is in, um, in general relativity, in a sense that they will make clear in a minute. So the thing that was before charge that is conserved and for which we define the field is now energy and momentum. But this causes now a slight difficulty because charge was essentially a scalar. So we had a scalar that is conserved. It's a number, it's so and so, so and so much charge. And in particular, number doesn't depend on the coordinate system. So we would all agree what the charge is of a particle independently of our choice of coordinate systems. That's what a scalar means. Now, obviously, this is not true for energy and momentum. Energy and momentum is not a scalar. We know that very well. We already treated energy and momentum. They're rather components of a vector. So it's obvious that if you see a particle, and that for me it's at rest, it may be moving for you as you're sitting in a train. So you would say it has a different amount of energy and in particular also a different amount of momentum. So the better idea is to say, let's consider energy momentum really as a vector. And the, as a vector, as a coordinate independent object, it's again defined for everyone. So then we are again on the same footing as for charge. We are now um, essentially talking about something that is defined um, independently of coordinates. Okay, so remember now how we defined the n vector. You have, see it here on the right hand side. The n vector was this integral. Um, and then we, again, we defined charge like this. So look at this expression again. And now I'll write down another expression. So the energy momentum tensor for point matter could, the idea would be the following. So this is now only first the idea, and then I will immediately give you the technical definition. The idea is to say that it should be a tensor because somehow it's, okay, everything was a tensor. Also N or Q was a tensor. A vector is of course a particular instance of a tensor. Let sum over all particles that are there, but this may change how many there are, of course, if new are created, but um, instead of now putting the charge, so instead of putting this thing here, let me maybe, um, let's, let me briefly put some colors here. So let me put a blue color, in the charge and then the um, green color here for the N. You see it here, still on the right hand side. I could now instead put something that replaces the blue thing and what replaces the blue thing will be a vector, namely the momentum of the particle U so I call it P, let me put here the U in brackets because it's not an, I mean, it's not an index in terms of a, an index of a vector. It's, it's the U, the, the momentum of the U's particle. And then for, the, I, so this replaces what was blue. Now I still replace what it was the green thing. And for the green thing, I just do the same as before. I just count whether there is a particle. Put here an N gamma U. Now this is a vector and this is a vector and I need somehow to make a joint object out of them. So I just put the tensor here. So by the way, this is not a derivation. I just tried to give you an intuition of how one could come up with something that at least makes sense. There's the, the reason why it looks like that is at the end, the physical reason that when we consider this object and put it into the right place in the equations, we get something that corresponds to how physics really behaves. But you can see that it's somehow a sensible object because it's, it contains here a quantity that is conserved. 
which is now, however, no longer a scalar, and it corresponds to this counting back the field that just looks, is there a particle in this four-dimensional space-time in the way we discussed it. But now you see this whole thing is now a tensor um, of rank or of type two zero, because this P is itself a vector. And if you take the tensor product of two vectors, you obviously get a two zero tensor. So indeed the energy momentum tensor is exactly defined based on that idea for the case of point particles. So let me write down the energy momentum tensor of a single point particle. Of course, um, above I just wrote the sum, but of course you, you know that um, I can again sum over all these particles and then I get tensor that would cover all particles there are. Let's suppose the particle has a world line that like before I call gamma and I indicate this here with a little gamma. Now because it's a two zero tensor, it has two indices ij. And now look at this expression that we have here. It will of course be very similar because the n that enters is very similar. So I will have a d tau. Then I have this big fraction that appears exactly in the same way as before. There's no difference there. I have the, the product over the delta functions of gamma i tau minus x i q. Okay, for this to make sense, I need to put the Q here on the left-hand side as well. So I define the tensor at any point of the manifold Q. Now I put the blue part, and the blue part is a vector which I call the momentum. And the momentum, as we already discussed earlier, is of course in coordinates given by the mass of the particle times the velocity, the four velocity, gamma dot, or the direction. So that's again the blue part. And then I have again the green part. But what's the green part? The green part was again just a gamma dot. So let me put the gamma dot here. And this is the second index j. So this was before I'm on the right hand side, the k that is in orange. I hope the expression makes sense because you already saw the earlier expression for the charge and you can somehow now see the differences. So there's twice a gamma dot entering, but actually for very different reasons. So remember that the second gamma dot was somehow introduced for us to be able to count particles. So the n just counted particles. This, it wasn't introduced to somehow get, get a velocity. Whereas the blue gamma dot is introduced as the conserved quantity. Here it takes the role of the charge together with the mass. Okay. Now let's see whether um, we can. Um, okay, so the, for many particles, we have T being the sum over those, that's clear. I will not discuss that any longer. In individual world lines and the corresponding energy momentum tensors that we add. I just want to remind you of something that um, we discussed as well a few weeks ago, namely that um, this P that I had before, which is of course m times gamma, so thing that enters here, can be written in terms of components in with respect to an observer. So we, remember when we discussed three and four velocities, we said that in order to define a three velocity, we need an observer. It's kind of a reference system. And then with respect to a coordinate system that is natural for that observer, namely one in which 
the observer rests, there is a velocity defined that is essentially the relative velocity to the other thing. And let's call that velocity V vector. It's this V velocity. Then we know that P was given by an expression that looked like this. It had this gamma factor in front, which is one over square root of this three velocity um, or square root of one minus the um, modulus of the three velocity. And it also includes a mass M. And then the other four components were essentially the same factor, one over one minus the three velocity squared and the square root of that times N times the three velocity. So these are three further components. So total, in total we have four components. And we could also approximate that in the case where the, velo where the three velocity is small. If the three velocity is small, then by just developing around v equals zero, we got an expression of that type. And here I just um, had the prefactor go, just goes away for the other um, three terms. So I just have n times v. And so this just means that the first term really corresponds to what we usually in classical mechanics understand as energy. And the last three terms correspond to momentum. And that's what you know already. This was just to remind you. Um, and this is now um, useful to understand what this T means. So let's now try to understand what, for example, T0 t, t, t zero, zero means. Now we need to combine everything we essentially know or that we derive today as understandings of the charge density and so on. So how could we inter interpret T0,0? Zero, zero? Note that the first zero, the index i, is the i appearing in P. So this i in P means I look at the zeroth component of i and therefore the energy. So this first zero really means I'm somehow referring to energy. Now, what does the second zero mean? The second zero is the one we already had for the charge before. So this was this index J that appeared because of the N operator. And now look at what we wrote down. So for the charge, the Q zero was co corresponding to a the spatial density. So the second zero means that you're talking about the spatial a density in space, in three space. So therefore, well, the, this first thing is energy, and the second zero means density. So the whole thing can be interpreted as the energy density. So I really want to stress that the two indices have completely different meanings. So the first zero refers to what is conserved, namely the energy, and the second is somehow in which um, in which direction, here in the time direction, which means we are looking at the density in space. Now I can do the same for other combinations. Let's look at zero J. What zero J? So the first zero again refers to energy. And the second one, the J, now refers to somehow the flow of that. So in, again, in a similar way as, or actually exactly analogous to when we said, for example, the Q1 corresponds to the current in the one direction. I could now say this is the current or the flow, if you want, in J direction of the energy. Okay, let me um, maybe still write it in terms of. Um, Yeah, maybe it's better um, to write it in terms of current density. So it's, um, no, let me, uh, so the, it's the flow of energy in J direction. Flow in J direction, sorry for, for that, of the energy. And, and just, I, I think it's, um, 
here it was just the density of energy. So you could also think of current density in J direction of the energy. Now let's look at the case where the I is non zero and um, the second index J is zero. Of course, the understanding, by the way, was here when, because I already treated the case where everything is zero that J is not zero. And here I'm now looking at the case where I is not zero. What does that correspond to? So the Ti is just the ice component of the momentum. That's what we said here. And the, sec and the zero means again a density. So it's therefore to be understood as the density of momentum in J in I direction. And now finally the Tij, that's the last combination. If you just combine everything I said, you could now say that it's the flow in J direction of momentum in I direction. So this is maybe a bit hard to grasp, but I, I hope you can see what this means. So it's, there could be momentum in a certain direction, but this momentum is a conserved quantity that itself flows into another direction. I think it's pretty clear when you look at it in terms of energy, then it's not confusing because I'm just saying energy flows in a certain direction, but in the same way, also momentum can flow in a certain direction. Now, um, okay, how much time is left? Yeah, let me make one example of such a, okay, example is maybe exaggerated. We could just, maybe it's more a relation to known terminology or slang. So people talk about dust when they mean particles that don't interact at all. So we already talked about point particles. Now think, of a cloud of point particles, which are somehow all moving more or less in the same direction. So if I'm looking at the small spot, they are all um, more, or, I mean, or let's I could phrase it like that. If, if I have dust, I could somehow go into an, a system, into a reference system, where I just move along with the dust so that the dust is more or less at rest with respect to me. Now, once I'm in this coordinate system, with respect to me, to which all these dust particles are more or less addressed, then I could um, somehow talk about the density in, a, in the usual sense, because now I'm in a coordinate dependent view, so I'm in this particular coordinate system, and I now, now could define the density. So let rho the density of dust particles. Dust sounds like something negative. Just think of particles which are in a certain coordinate system more or less at rest. And that's usually what is the case for real dust. It's always at rest on my desk. So let's will be the density of dust particles um, in coordinate system That is kind of, I call that co moving with them. I guess you know what it means. I'm just at the same speed, more or less, as the dust particles. Then everything gets quite easy because now I could say that the energy momentum tensor has to have the form that there's only an element here and all the other elements are zero. Let me explain why this is the case. There are different ways to see that. One way to see that is to look at just the definition of T for point particles, because, because dust are point particles. Now, if I define, if I take this definition in the coordinate system in which I'm co-moving with the dust particles, then of course the velocity of the dust particles, the three velocity is zero, which means that the four velocity is just essentially one vector, 
pointing only in the time direction. So it has a one here and a zero otherwise. So these are just one zero 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 vectors. And obviously, if I take the tensor product, product of one zero 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 vectors, I get only an entry in the first um, place. And then um, here, of course, I have delta functions. But if I integrate over delta functions over many particles and somehow average, then I get a density. So this actually relates now to something that I was asked some time ago. Isn't it a problem if we consider point particles? Actually, when we go to dust, this is likely considered so many point particles that we don't worry about the individual delta functions. We just say that it's now some density. And usually, we assume that this is even smooth. So in other words, dust um, could be regarded as just many point particles, so many that if I coarse grain the view and, and not interested in really the microscopic details, I can just describe it like that with a smooth um, rule, which is a den the density. I can also understand it, of course, from this. If I have dust and if I'm commuting with them, then I have essentially only the energy, but the energy in the rest frame is just the mass. So this is essentially then corresponding to the density. And I don't have any contributions from there because I'm just they are at rest with respect to me. Um, let me also just define something that people use, which is a general perfect fluid. So you see, now we have to somehow model matter. And modeling matter is not really part of GR. So this is where GR gets input from other branches of, of physics. And of course, one branch of physics is classical mechanics, or statistical mechanics, where you fluid mechanics. And you could ask yourself, how does a fluid look like if I now take this picture? I no longer go to the individual particle picture, but average in the right way over it. And then I get something that has the following form. I get an energy momentum tensor that has again the rho, which is the density of the fluid, plus the pressure of the fluid. And then I put here the u, which is um, the vector co-moving with the fluid. So just write that minus, again, the density times g. Remember our, not our sign conventions. This may be different with other sign conventions. So this u is essentially the forward velocity of the fluid. Because that's a, a vector field. But at any point in space, time, the fluid has a certain velocity. And then um, you take that as a vector. Then the fluid has also a certain pressure. You put that here as a scalar and a certain density. I didn't derive that. So that would really be a matter of fluid mechanics. But the idea would be that if you take the picture that we essentially justify and the individual particle picture, and now go to a limit where you have so many particles that you don't want to treat them individually, but rather want to treat them as a new continuous object, then you get something like that. But that's outside of the realm of what you're going to do in this image. There's also other matter in the universe. And the other matter that is there in the universe is radiation. So that's essentially electromagnetic matter. And maybe, um, or I hope you have seen in electrodynamics. Now, I again connect to something else before I connect to hydrodynamics. Now we want to see what about electromagnetic matter. In electrodynamics, you hopefully have seen that I can, that we can describe the electromagnetic field completely by a zero two tensor. So we'll probably also discuss that a little bit more next week, but um, just to give you an idea, that's, we have already seen that in the very first exercises once, I think, and it's a repetition that we can, that there's a tensor that contains essentially all the information about the electromagnetic field. And now, if we have an electromagnetic field configuration, electron light, for example, is also mapped, I said that already last time, and it therefore also has a corresponding energy momentum tensor. The point is that 
this energy momentum tends has to be calculated. That's again not now the real of TR, although I may give you a derivation of that if there is time left in next week. And it somehow depends on the electromagnetic field. So it has one term like this. Again, with our sign convention, it has a second term, which is plus, which is an, again the electromagnetic field, tensor M N. And here I just use the fact that you can lower and raise indices with connections. So here this was defined with lower indices, but you can raise them. So this is a well defined object. If you like and have um, have the endurance to do it, you can just, as a test, for example, calculate T0, zero. And what you will find is not very surprisingly, this thing, that you get the energy, uh, the electromagnetic vector, the electric field vector modulus squared plus the magnetic field vector modulus squared, the whole thing one half. That's, of course, just the energy of the electromagnetic field. So this is now in agreement with what I said before, that the T0 zero, zero component corresponds to the, um, to the energy of whatever matter you have. So that's also true here. And you could also, for example, look at TOI. And then you would find if you do the calculation, which you can do, you just have to evaluate this based on what I wrote here. So that's a very mechanical thing to do. There's nothing and special about it, you need to know more than basic calculation rules to find that these are the components of what is often called the pointing vector, which is somehow the, the, how the energy in the electromagnetic field flows. Okay, I think we are almost over time now. I nevertheless want to do one final thing is kind of the whole point of this lecture. I want to finally write down the Einstein field equations because now we are finally in the position where we, that we can do it. Which is called one equation. Remember I mentioned already some time ago that we understand the geometric side of the equation. The equation has two sides, the left side, side and the right side. And on the left side, we have purely geometric objects, namely the Ricci tensor and the Ricci scalar. Then, and this is something I will just discuss lot next time, but I add it already. One can also put something else to the geometry, which is cosmological constant. I also need to make a tensor out of it, but don't worry about this for the moment. It's not even obvious that it has to be on the left hand side. You may also move it to the right hand side. I think I also called the whole left part here, or not the whole one, but this part G, IJ. This is also known as the Einstein tensor. So this is something we understood already since quite some time. Now there's the right hand side, and the right hand side has a three factor, a pi, and gravitational constant. And then, not surprisingly, after what I told you, it's the energy momentum tensor that I'm interested in. Here with the index, index is lowered, but of course I can raise and lower indices with G. So the reason why we did all that work about matter, treating matter, is we need to somehow treat matter in the way that, in, that is relevant for gravity. So we essentially have to treat matter um, as a source. I mean, we somehow know, or maybe Einstein or knew before he did a lot of theory, that matter has to be the source of gravity. And we need to do that already. But the question is, how exactly does it enter? Is it just the mass? No, it's not. That's what we learned. It's is it the energy? No, it's also not just the energy. It's a more complicated object. It's an object that has that is a CO2 tensor. So as you will see, it's symmetric, but it's an object with many degrees of freedom that somehow captures how matter is arranged in the universe, how it moves. And this all matter. This all matters. So it's not the same that you have just a mass staying there or something moving. 
different energy momentum tensor, and therefore the geometry on the left hand side will be different. So, the treatment of matter we have is, was of course directed to exactly get that. So, if you ask ourselves why did we treat matter in that particular way, the ultimate answer is this is the way how it sources or how it interacts with geometry as given by the Einstein theory. I think this is a good point to end the lecture of today. I think um, we have now finally, after almost um, Christmas, arrived at the place where we can state the fundamental equation of general relativity. But it's even contrast to electrodynamics, where you learned all the concepts already before in analysis one and two and so on. In general relativity, we had to introduce them first. First, we had to talk a lot about geometry, about differential geometry, but also the right hand side, the way matter is treated is not as easy. It's not like a Newtonian gravity, where it's just a point mass and everyone understands at least roughly what that should be. So that's also something we have to work on quite hard. Of course, connected to, to geometry, because matter is again embedded into space time. So we have to understand how to generalize the concept of density, realize that density is not just the scale, but the vector and so on into all that. But now we have reached the goal, and I hope that we're for the moment happy that we are there. We can now essentially move on and just apply the series. Now we have built up everything and we move on now to applications. Okay, see you next week.